Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 845 for November 15th, 2020. As we begin the 16th year of the world's longest running whiskey podcast series. Coming up in a few minutes. It makes me sick to my stomach. It's frustrating. It's like banging your head up against a wall and you just keep getting your head crushed in. So uh, we're going to keep at it and hopefully persistence ultimately will be the key for success. Trade disputes over the last three years between the United States and Europe have taken a big toll on the whiskey world, not only for whiskey makers, but for whiskey lovers on both sides of the Atlantic in the form of higher prices and fewer choices. This past week, the European Union announced a new round of tariffs on American rums, brandies, vodkas, and vermouths as the spirits industry continues to be collateral damage in a long-running dispute over aviation subsidies. With a new administration coming to the White House in January, could that lead to a change in what has become a dysfunctional relationship between two allies? Chris Swanger of the Distilled Spirits Council joins me on Whiskey Cast in depth with his perspective. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice behind the label, and we're, I suppose, trying to not recreate the flavors that were in the original spots, but definitely pay tribute to how they originally came about. No need to feel blue. It's time for this week's edition of Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Robin Redbreast? You may have seen me around. Face label, label face. Yeah, that's the one. I'm now contractually obligated to be their spokesbird. <laughs> yeah, my agent didn't read the small print. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Hey, whiskey fans, I'm Gabriel Cartarella, brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended Scotch whiskey, Jewers. You could probably guess I've got a lot of stories. But for me, the good ones have one thing in common. They're best told over a glass of whiskey. So hit pause, grab your bottle of Dewar's, and let's get back to this episode of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. There's a lot of tension in Washington right now, not just because of the election, but the threat of what might happen between now and Inauguration Day on January 20th. The European Union announced last Monday that it would add 25% tariffs on a wide range of American-made exports. But for our purposes, we'll focus on exports of rum, brandy, vodka, and vermouth. That matches the EU's existing 25% tariff on imports of American whiskies that has been in place since June of 2018. The new tariffs are Europe's response to the latest World Trade Organization ruling in the 16-year-old fight over aircraft subsidies. In this case, the WTO ruled that financial aid from the U.S. and the state of Washington to Boeing violated global trade agreements. It's the counterpart to the ruling last year that the U.S. won in its complaint over European subsidies to Airbus, that led to the Trump administration imposing a 25% tariff on single malt whiskies from Scotland and Northern Ireland, along with liqueurs and cordials from throughout Europe. Trump administration trade negotiators had warned before the election that the U.S. would respond to any action by the Europeans, and that has Distilled Spirits Council CEO Chris Swanger worried. We were anticipating that this was going to come, and now we've just got to hold our breath a little bit to see if the U.S. may react to that. Uh, so we're worried about that, and we'll see how it plays out over the coming weeks. I'll have more with Chris Swanger later in Whiskey Cast in depth, and just how quickly could the U.S. impose new tariffs? I'll explain that later when we go behind the label. In other news, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to shortages of a lot of things over the last few months, 
and in some cases, that includes whiskey. There have been a lot of comments on social media recently about Crown Royal lovers finding empty shelves at their local stores, and a few local news reports talking with liquor store owners who can't get their orders for Crown Royal filled. Keep in mind that Crown Royal is the number one selling Canadian whiskey in the U.S. With more than 6.8 million cases of whiskey sold last year, there's a lot of demand. However, there is also a shortage of truck drivers in both the U.S. and Canada because of the pandemic. Trucking companies have been having a big problem finding drivers who are willing to go out on the road and risk being infected with COVID-19. Diageo's bottling plant in Amherstburg, Ontario, bottles all of the Crown Royal sold around the world, with the exception of some 50-milliliter airline-sized bottles. That plant in Amherstburg is subject to Ontario provincial public health restrictions. A Diageo spokesperson told me in an email this week that those restrictions have had an impact on Crown Royal production. They are working to resolve it as soon as they can. We have a few milestones to mention this week. Scotland's Isle of Rassie Distillery bottled its first official single malt whiskey this week. It's the first legal whiskey ever distilled on the island and will be available soon through the distillery's website. No word yet on pricing. And construction is officially underway now on the Port of Leith Distillery in Edinburgh. The distillery is being built with a vertical design to cut down on the real estate footprint. It'll be 40 meters high when it opens in 2022. Meanwhile, Hinch Distillery in Northern Ireland laid down its first casks of New Make Spirit this past week. The distillery is located in Ballina Hinch in County Down and will open up to visitors next spring, pandemic permitting. Also in County Down, the Ecklinville Distillery in Kirkubbin is in line for a major expansion. The distillery has been approved for almost 660,000 pounds in support from Invest Northern Ireland toward the project, which is expected to cost a total of more than 9 million pounds. South of the Irish border now, Lambay Whiskey is a step closer to getting a micro distillery built on the tiny island off the Irish coast near Dublin. The project has been approved for almost €193,000 in funding from the Dublin Rural Leader Local Action Group through a County Dublin Jobs Creation Program. And Ireland's Killowen Distillery is out with the latest single cask whiskey in its Integrity series. It's an oatmeal imperial stout cask finish bottled at cask strength. No word on pricing. A big milestone out of Ireland this week. For the first time in nearly 60 years, the entire spot range of Irish whiskies is available once again. Irish distillers unveiled Blue Spot this past Wednesday. It's the last of the original four whiskies distilled at the Jameson Bow Street Distillery in Dublin and sold by Mitchell and Sons to be revived. Green Spot never did go away, but the 12-year-old Yellow Spot was revived in 2012, and the 15-year-old Red Spot returned two years ago. That release prompted a lot of questions about when Blue Spot might return, and Middleton Master Distiller Kevin O'Gorman told us it's been in the works for quite a while now. Now was the time to do it, and we have the, I suppose, the amazing influence of the Madeira Cass. So once again, we have the American barrels, we have the Oloroso Sherry, and now we have the, the Madeira uh, to, to add to the equation. And they're all back together again, and they can be you know, found in the shelves. And I suppose it's just great to see them all back together again. I mean, it's 50, 60 years. Kevin O'Gorman joined us on the Friday Happy Hour webcast the other night, along with Middleton distiller Catherine Condon and blender Dave McCabe. You can watch the entire conversation on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. Blue Spot is seven years old. It's being released in cask strength batches, with the initial batch bottled at 58.7% ABV. It's available now in Ireland and Europe, 
at 80 euro a bottle and will be available in the U.S. starting in February. There's no word yet on U.S. pricing. I'll have my tasting notes for Blue Spot in a few minutes. Now, Redbreast 12-year-old is not new, but there's a new version of it available. The Project Wingman Bird Feeder Bottle comes in a copper casing that can then be used as a bird feeder. It's in partnership with BirdLife International. 15 euro from each bottle sold will go to the conservation group. 2,000 bottles will be available over the next month through the Redbreast website, with 500 available each Monday through December 7th. Unfortunately, they will not be available in the U.S. Other new whiskeys announced this week. Heaven Hill celebrates its 85th anniversary on December 13th and is releasing a single-barrel bourbon to mark the occasion. It was filled on December 13th, 2006 and emptied last December 13th. It's bottled at 53.5% ABV, 107 proof, which just happens to be Heaven Hill's original barrel entry proof back in 1935. It'll be available only at the Bourbon Heritage Center in Bardstown and select Kentucky retailers for $300 a bottle. Decanta is releasing a special bottling of 35-year-old Karuazawa that was distilled back in 1981. It's being sold as a three-bottle set with each of the three bottles featuring hand-painted artwork from a trio of Japanese street artists, the Budo Collection has a list price of $45,000 a set. Chivas Brothers has unveiled this year's Distillery Reserve Collection with 48 single-cask whiskies from its 13 malt whiskey distilleries in Scotland. Ten of the bottlings come from the Glenlivet, along with whiskies from Aberlour, Strathisla, Long Morn, and the company's newest distillery, Dalmunoch, which was built on the site of the old Imperial Distillery. In fact, it's the first official bottling of Dalmunoch, which opened in 2014. The whiskies will only be available through the gift shops at the Glenlivet, Strathisla, Aberlour, and Scapa distilleries, while the Glenlivet's website will have some of those whiskies available for sale in Europe. Compass Box's original Magic Cask Whiskey was an exclusive bottling for the Liquor Control Board of Ontario more than a decade ago. Now the Magic Cask name is being revived for a new blended malt. It's blended from malt whiskey that was a year old when it was put into First Fill Oloroso seasoned casks three years ago, along with a batch of First Fill X bourbon barrels from that long-closed Imperial Distillery. Magic Cask is being rolled out around the world, no details yet on pricing. Italy's Puni Distillery is releasing Arte Edition 1. It's almost seven years old and matured in a combination of ex-bourbon and refill scotch whiskey barrels, with a large percentage of those coming from Isla. It's available for around 70 euro a bottle from the distillery's visitor's center and the Puni online shop. And finally, the Laws Whiskey House in Denver is out with a new limited edition Ruby Port Cask finished bourbon. It was aged for three years in new charred oak barrels, then spent two more years in Portuguese Ruby Port French oak casks. It'll carry a recommended retail price of $75 a bottle. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. A quick program note now. We'll be taking this week's Happy Hour webcast on the road Friday, just a short drive down Interstate 95 to Baltimore and the Sagamore Spirit Distillery. Of course, Sagamore Spirit sponsors the What I'm Tasting This Week department each week. Saturday morning, we'll be doing a special live webcast as they release the second annual preview batch of Penny's Proof. That's the rye whiskey they've been distilling in Baltimore for nearly four years now. 
On our Friday night show, Colin Scott will join me from Scotland. He's the longtime Chivas Brothers master blender who retired earlier this year and has now joined the Last Drop Distillers as its first ever master blender. We'll talk with the Sagamore Spirit folks as well. The fun starts at 5 p.m. New York time Friday on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, Twitter, and Periscope. And you can watch on those same links Saturday morning. We're still working out the exact start time for Saturday, so keep an eye on our social media links for more details. Of course, it's all subject to any public health restrictions that may change this week. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. We had one change in plans announced this week. The organizers of the Whiskey Festival Nord Nederland in the Netherlands are postponing their weekend event scheduled for next March. They said on their website that there's no way to tell whether COVID 19 restrictions will be lifted in time to allow exhibitors and speakers to make plans to attend. So they've rescheduled their festival for the last weekend of October next year. Meanwhile, the Kilkenny Whiskey Guild in Ireland will be holding an online tasting of whiskeys from closed distilleries this Wednesday night, November 18th. Bonhams has an auction of rare whiskeys and wines at its Hong Kong gallery on Friday and Saturday with remote bidding available. The Spirit of Toronto Festival's series of virtual tastings continues this week with Heaven Hill's Connor O'Driscoll and Jody Filiatro on Friday night and Keith Cruikshank of Ben Romick on Sunday, followed by Glenn Scotia's Ian McAllister on the 28th and Highland Park's Gordon Motion on the 29th to wrap up the series. Druitt's has a live online auction of rare whiskeys and wines on the 26th of November, and Glenn Fittick's Mark Thompson will be holding a free online masterclass presented by Waitrose and Partners that same day. Buffalo Trace Distillery will turn on its holiday lights December 3rd with lighting displays each night through New Year's Day. And the Taipei Whiskey Club's final meetup of 2020 will be on December 9th in Taiwan's capital city. We're updating the calendar of events at WhiskeyCast.com throughout the week as we get word on new events and updates on changes to previously scheduled ones. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits, including their brand new rye whiskey finished in Catoctin Creek's own Short Hill Mountain Peach Brandy Barrels. Peach Barrel Select Rye Whiskey goes on sale starting Monday at the distillery in Purcellville, Virginia, and wherever you find Catoctin Creek whiskeys. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com for details, and please drink responsibly. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Gabriel Cartarella again, the doer's guy. I've seen a lot in my years as brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch. Like the time I got a hold of an actual letter written by Andrew Carnegie. A letter from 1891, in it asking doers to ship a keg of whiskey to President Benjamin Harrison at the White House. Spoiler alert, we did. And the bourbon folks were not too happy about it. Pretty cool, right? Well, here's another story for you. In 2019, our master blender, Stephanie McLeod, became the first woman to be awarded Master Blender of the Year by the International Whiskey Competition. And a year after that, she won it again. Stephanie's first creation for Dewar's, Dewar's 15 year, is another piece of history. Sweet, floral, with notes of honey and toffee, a perfectly balanced addition to the Dewar's lineup. It's a great introduction to scotch for beginners, and it's more than complex enough to satisfy whiskey aficionados. So grab some Dewar's 15, call some friends, and make a few stories of your own. That's what a good bottle of whiskey is all about. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Back to our top story of the week now, the threat of another round of U.S. tariffs on whiskeys and other spirits imported from Europe, as the trade war between the Trump administration and the European Union continues to boil. Last week, I read a question on Your Voice from Ryan Sheridan asking about the chances of the tariffs on whiskeys being reduced once Joe Biden is inaugurated. 
While I tried to answer that question last week, I figured it would be better to ask an expert in Washington. Chris Swanger is the CEO of the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States. Discus is just one of several trade groups on both sides of the Atlantic that have been spending a lot of time the last couple of years trying to persuade U.S. and European trade officials to dial back the rhetoric and the tariffs that are hurting whiskey companies worldwide. We've had a lot to talk about this week in terms of uh, the tariffs, first of all, that Europe put on other spirits other than whiskey. But obviously that still has an impact on the spirits business in general, which includes whiskey makers. What does it mean to the industry? Well, Mark, no doubt uh, the news that came out on Monday with the EU's plans to impose a 25% tariff on American uh, rum and vodka and brandy is uh, greatly disappointing. Uh, As you know, the spirits industry on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, DISCA certainly has been on point with this, has been really pleading with both the EU and the Trump administration to get to the negotiating table and resolve these tariffs that have been imposed on American whiskey and EU spirits as well. In fact, uh, since June 2018, when the EU imposed a 25% tariff on American whiskey, we've seen a 41% decline in exports of American whiskey to the EU. And in addition to that, since the Trump administration imposed tariffs on single malt scotch cordials and liqueurs. We've seen a 34% decline in imports of single malt scotch and a 28% decline on cordials and liqueurs. So the impact of these tariffs is devastating. And uh, we are in great coordination with Spirits Europe, which is the Discus's counterpart, really uh, encouraging uh, both governments to get to the negotiating table and stay at the negotiating table. Uh, Certainly with the transition of a Biden administration coming in to power, uh, certainly we're anticipating uh, President-elect Biden will take a more uh, collaborative approach, I think, with our European trading partners. And we do hope uh, that reset Uh, will give us a path to get these issues resolved sooner rather than later. Let's put dollar figures on those losses. 41% in the U.S. exports to Europe, 34%, and 25% of the European exports to the U.S. What kind of dollars are we talking about here? Let's put this into real money. We haven't done that estimate, but that's a great question. And after this, well, get with our economists, but it's devastating. It is devastating uh, across the board. I mean, you take the pandemic and all the challenges associated with the pandemic, uh, with distilleries having to shut down and closing down the tasting rooms and so forth. uh, And you take that on top of these tariffs. It is just really a sad state of affairs for our industry. And uh, we will not rest until we get these issues resolved. And to be honest with you, the EU and the U.S. should be embarrassed that it's gotten to this point. These tariffs were imposed on distilled spirits on issues nothing to do with our industry. And from 1997 to June 2018, Both the EU and the U.S. enjoyed a tariff-free zone on distilled spirits, which allowed for 450% import and export growth between the two markets. So this is just beyond ridiculous. Uh, We are very, very frustrated, obviously, and we hope that these issues can get resolved. Now, we do know, of course, uh, I had the opportunity to have Uh, discussions with senior leadership at USTR. We do know they are talking and trying to resolve the Boeing and Airbus uh, case issue, Uh, but that only includes a part of it because we have the 25% tariff on American whiskey, and that's related to the steel and aluminum dispute. So we're just going to keep at it, and uh, hopefully we can remove these tariffs sooner rather than later and get back to growth. 
the unknowns of the impact, you know, uh, capturing market share, you know, uh, American whiskey has really been enjoyed a uh, great consumer interest in Europe. And, uh, you know, how long are we going to be able to regain that footing back that momentum? I mean, that's really the unknown, but I could tell you the dollars and cents value of it. It's in the millions and millions of dollars in sweat and time and effort uh, where many distilleries aren't even exporting over back to Europe at this point because of the tariff. And who knows what the impact's going to be on the tariff that was just imposed on Tuesday. And there is a possibility the U.S. could certainly retaliate, and they could retaliate in kind uh, with more tariffs on EU spirits. So obviously we're watching that and following that very closely. What has this done to the consumers out there in terms of uh, reducing availability of spirits, in terms of price increases? What's the consumer impact on Main Street from this? Well, it's, it's taken, taken money right out of their pocket, number one. And number two, uh, it's probably impacting the consumer's ability to have choice, right? There were uh, many uh, distillers that were excited about exporting to the European market, and they've just stood down from that, right? So at the end of the day, this has a direct impact on consumers. And as I mentioned, we just won't really be able to measure, uh, at least for some time, uh, the impact on the momentum for American whiskey, right? Uh, American whiskey is a, was a growing, thriving market in the EU. And just the impact of that uh, is unknown, but it's got to be significant. And the proof is in the pudding, 41% decline in exports. And look, part of my frustration really lies with Europeans because there was no need for them to impose the tariff on American whiskey, you know, Certainly, there were issues going on with the steel and aluminum dispute between the U.S. and the EU, but uh, to some degree, they fired the first shot, and it was just really, really unfortunate and un- unnecessary. But certainly, I can appreciate the Trump administration's aggressive trade posture with Europe probably contributed to that, and uh, there's a lot of different views on, on, on the tactics that this administration has used. But when the tariffs were imposed on American whiskey, that was taking us down a path to where we are today. And uh, we've just just got to get a reset. And we're pushing as hard as we can. And the impact here in the States on Scotch whiskey lovers and lovers of Irish single malts that have been affected. Consumer choice. I know uh, uh, Karen Betts, who was my counterpart with the Scotch Whiskey Association, Karen and I talked uh, uh, I think three times this week. I mean, it's, it's devastating. Now, uh, we do have a, a sidebar issue percolating. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have been negotiating a bilateral trade agreement. And uh, as I think everybody's aware, at the end of the year, the U.K. is scheduled to leave the EU uh, uh, as it relates to Brexit. So there could be an opportunity where uh, through the negotiations between the U.S. and the U.K., maybe they can make an agreement on the tariffs as well. So uh, we're working that angle. It's a very complex situation, right? You've got Brexit happening. You've got the challenges between the U.S. and the EU. You've got trade negotiations between the U.S. and the U.K. And then you have an incoming, you know, a presumably incoming new administration. So uh, it is complex and we've got some challenges because we've got to not only uh, encourage both the EU and the U.S. to come to a resolution on a 16, 17-year-old trade dispute over Boeing and Airbus, but then at the same time, we've also got to unravel uh, the tariffs related to the steel and aluminum case. So we're up to our ears and alligators and on behalf of Discus, we recognize the great pain this is bearing on our, on our member companies, and it just it makes me sick to my stomach. It's frustrating. It's like banging your head up against a wall, and you just keep getting your head crushed in. So uh, we're going to keep at it, and hopefully persistence ultimately will be the key for success. In the uh, attempts to persuade the administration to not impose these tariffs, you and the other trade organizations within the spirits and uh, 
overall beverage alcohol industry were arguing that this is going to create job losses in the states. Have we seen any evidence of that happening yet? Have we seen distributors and retailers cutting back on jobs because of lower sales of Scotch whiskey and the, uh, the other spirits from Europe that are subject to these tariffs in the states? Yeah, yes. Yes, for sure. And we did a survey over the summer, uh, particularly with our craft distillers. The challenge to be able to have, uh, put our finger exactly on the tariffs is tough because you've got to combine that with the challenges associated with the pandemic. So jobs aren't being created, I tell you that, as a result of the tariffs. And no doubt you combine the pandemic and the challenges associated with that along with the tariffs. That is contributing to job loss, uh, no doubt about it. So, and it's just really, really unfortunate. And the American whiskey story is a great American success story. And these trade disputes have really thwarted, uh, you know, an exciting uh, American success story. And it's going to take years to uh, get that momentum back. But, you know, eventually, at the end of the day, the consumers love American whiskey. Consumers love great single malt scotch and the great cordials and liqueurs that come back and forth. And, uh, you know, I think we'll regain our footing, but it's going to take some time. You mentioned the presumptive incoming administration. We assume that January 20th will bring the inauguration of Joe Biden. What do we know about his trade policies and how it's going to affect this? Um, I read through the platform and obviously he doesn't address the spirits tariffs at all in the platform. But the campaign did say that they wanted to work with their European counterparts to reduce the oversupply of steel that led to the steel tariffs, which led to the bourbon tariffs in Europe and sent us down this rabbit hole. What do we know about the incoming Biden administration and how this is going to get resolved? I do believe, uh, well, it won't, it won't be quick and easy, number one, uh, because it's going to take some time, right? So probably won't be till February, early March uh, for the, the new administration to get their key people into USTR and so forth. So uh, unfortunately, it's probably going to require some patience on, on our part. But all indications are uh, certainly the president-elect uh, wants to reset the relationship with our European trading partners uh, for the better, right? And just taking down the temperature that ex- has existed between the U.S. and the EU over the last four years is a big, big component of it. So we are uh, optimistic and encouraged that we could uh, really uh, be the benefactor of a reset. Now, as it relates to the Bowen and Airbus case, I mean, that's been a 16 plus year dispute. Uh, and in just in discussions with USTR earlier this week, uh, they have made a lot of progress in trying to find a settlement with the Europeans, but clearly they're not there yet. Uh, we were anticipating, uh, worried that uh, Monday's announcement by the EU to impose tariffs could happen. Uh, we really don't understand why they would do that because we understand that both parties want to find a negotiated settlement. So uh, when the announcement came out on Monday of imposing tariffs on American rum, vodka, and brandy, it was a raw feeling. Will that apply to Puerto Rican rum as well? I assume it would since Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. As I understand it, yes. Yeah. Just to ask a rum question since we focus on whiskeys around here, but... uh... One of the things I pointed out in answering a similar question about this on our last episode was that the entire Boeing Airbus dispute, as you point out, goes back 16 years. It started in the Bush administration and went through the entire eight years of the Obama-Biden administration. So it seems to me that if Biden and many of the players that he's bringing back into or plans to bring back into power at the White House... If they'd wanted to resolve this four years ago, five, six, seven, eight years ago, it would have been resolved. And that leads me to believe that uh, there may not be as much of a desire on the Biden administration's part to resolve this right away. It may not be their focus because 
if it had been a focus, it would have been dealt with years ago. Potentially. I mean, uh, if uh, that, that, that possibly could happen, no doubt about it. And, and look, I don't want to be critical of the Trump administration. I mean, uh, to some degree, you've got to appreciate and recognize that this administration, uh, albeit tough, right, has, has really taken on some really longstanding trade issues, not only between the U.S. and the EU, but with China as well, right? And uh, this administration was trying to negotiate a deal with Brazil and India. You know, markets where we've had longstanding uh, trade challenges, right? Certainly what will be interesting to watch with the legacy of uh, the Trump administration is uh, will future administrations at least relook at uh, trade relations trade deficits differently. Now, certainly a lot of people will have, you know, strong views on this administration's tactics and personality, the persona uh, that was driven. But to some degree, you've just got to recognize that this administration was trying to crack the net on some longstanding issues that have been ignored for some time, right? But as a result of that, we've been uh, great victims of that, uh, thanks to the EU imposing that tariff on American whiskey, right? And if, if you know, I just, I wished it wouldn't have resulted in of that. But I think to some degree, there's going to be some legacy to what this administration was trying to do. You know, there could be a lot of criticism in terms of style and persona and approach, but they were trying to tackle some really, really tough stuff. And as, as a result of that, we have been great victims of that. So I think to some degree, uh, both the EU and the U.S. have publicly stated that they want to get the Airbus Boeing situation resolved. And the U.S. and Washington State have taken corrective actions to address the alleged subsidy issues for Boeing. And uh, I think uh, Airbus and the EU have tried to do the same. So the stage is set to get it resolved. And I think maybe with a reset of different personalities and Biden's uh, commitment really to build a stronger rapport with our European trading partners, I think hopefully uh, that'll set the stage to get these tariffs removed off uh, distilled spirits. The last thing that I would say is there is no light between the U.S. distilled spirits industry and the European distilled spirits industry. We are actively uh, coordinating with each other. We both uh, fully support the removal of these tariffs. And uh, if there's any uh, positive uh, outcome uh, with all of this is uh, we are well coordinated well in line uh, to get these issues resolved. There's no competitive play here. We all recognize this this is a a terrible, terrible detriment to our great industry, and uh, we're working very hard to overcome it. Thanks to Chris Swanger, the CEO of the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States, for spending some time with us this week. This is a story we will keep following not just because it affects whiskey makers, but whiskey lovers on both sides of the Atlantic in terms of what whiskeys are available to you and how much you pay for them. In a few minutes on Behind the Label, I'll look at just how quickly a new round of U.S. tariffs could go into effect. It's a lot faster than you might think. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, Whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with the new release of Blue Spot from Irish Distillers, The first batch is a Madeira cask-finished seven-year-old single-pot still whiskey bottled at 58.7% ABV. The nose has a tropical tartness with touches of lime, pineapple, and a hint of banana, balanced by subtle spices, a touch of nuttiness, and a hint of apple pie. 
The taste has a complex balance of spices, oakiness, and nutty character, with baking spices, black pepper, touches of tropical fruits, and a hint of hazelnut. The finish is amazingly long and complex, with a tropical character and lingering hints of spices and hazelnut. It's a whopper of a whiskey. I'm scoring Blue Spot a 95. I also received a sample the other day of Brook Laddie's Black Art 8.1. It's a 26-year-old Isla single malt distilled back in 1994 and matured in a secret combination of casks. It's bottled at 45.1% ABV, and the nose is complex with citrus fruits and hints of apricots, dried flowers, and a bit of hazelnut. The taste is complex and well-balanced with a mix of woody spices, fruits, vanilla, and a touch of nuttiness. The finish is long and sweet with touches of dried fruits, honey, nuts, and a bit of oak. It's also an amazing whiskey and lives up to the Black Art reputation for excellence. I'm scoring the Black Art 8.1 from Brook Laddie, a 95 as well. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Friday the 13th may be thought of as unlucky, but that's why Sagamore Spirit celebrates Rye Day the 13th instead. Sagamore Spirit is offering you the chance to win your own barrel of whiskey, sort of. Find out more at sagamorespirit.com slash Day the 13th. The contest ends on December 31st, and don't forget to join us on Saturday for a special live webcast from the Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore on Penny's Proof Day. Sagamore Spirit reminds you to always drink responsibly. Let's move on now to the Chivas Regal 13-year-old Manchester United edition, which is partially finished in American rye whiskey casks and bottled at 40% ABV. The nose has hints of orange peel, gentle spices, milk chocolate, honey, and vanilla. The taste has a touch of cinnamon spice, balanced by citrusy tartness, vanilla, and underlying touches of clove and allspice. The finish, long and gentle, with subtle spices and citrus fruits. I'm scoring the Chivas Regal 13-year-old Manchester United edition a 92. I mentioned during the news that Northern Ireland's Hinch Distillery filled its first casks with New Make Spirit this past week. Hinch has also released a peated Irish single malt sourced from an undisclosed distillery. It's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has a nice smokiness with lemon pepper spice, dried grass, and touches of tropical fruits, toasted caramel, and vanilla. The taste starts off with a nice balance of tartness and spice, followed by a nice burst of peat smoke, along with honey, vanilla, and a hint of licorice. The finish has lingering spices, a hint of citrusy tartness, and a gentle smokiness that pulls it all together. I'm scoring the Hinch Peated Irish Single Malt, a 92. And let's finish up with a decadent whiskey. Widow Jane's Decadence is a blend of 10-year-old bourbons finished in maple syrup barrels from New York State's Crown Maple Syrup. It's bottled at 45% ABV, the nose has nice notes of charred oak and birch firewood, dried tobacco leaves, toasted caramel, and subtle spices. The taste has a nice maple syrup sweetness with a good balance between the maple character and touches of cinnamon, honey, candied fruits, and a hint of nuttiness. The long finish has maple sweetness complemented by dry spices and just a hint of honey. I'm scoring Widow Jane Decadence a 91. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,000 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. 
And now, a Thanksgiving message from Robin Redbreast. What am I thankful for? Hmm. <laughs> Being on the smaller end of the bird scale. Happy Thanksgiving from Redbreast. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Time now to open up the inbox for your voice. I posted my tasting notes for Blue Spot on the website Wednesday, and Carl Schmidt of the Morgantown Whiskey Guild in West Virginia responded with this tweet. Mark, you gave this 95 points. That's got to be in your top 1 to 5 percent, correct? A whiskey cast 95 is a 100, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, Carl's not being critical here, but I have taken some flack over the years because some people consider me to be overly generous in my scoring. Carl's tweet prompted me to do a little bit of math. I know, I know, me and math don't work well together. But it turns out that, as of Wednesday, there were 3,016 different tasting notes on the WhiskeyCast website, Just 185 of them received scores of 95 or above. To be precise, that is 6%. Keep in mind that if we translated my numerical scores into letter grades, only whiskeys scoring 93 points or higher would get an A. It proves my argument that there are a lot of very good whiskeys out there, but very few great ones. By the way, that was before I tasted the Black Art 8.1, so it's now 186 whiskeys, scoring 95 or higher, just to be precise. I tweeted that out later on Wednesday, and at Rye Whiskey Lover in New Orleans responded, Can you post that list of 185? No, but you can actually look it up for yourself. That's because one of the search options in the Tasting Notes section at the WhiskeyCast website allows you to enter a specific number, and it'll give you the notes for all of the whiskeys I've given that score to. You can also search by whiskey type, country, and other variables, too. I really want to thank all of you who emailed, tweeted, and otherwise congratulated us on the 15th anniversary of the very first Whiskey Cast episode this past Thursday. There were too many notes to share, but please know that we are grateful for each and every one of you. Just to let you know, I did celebrate with a dram of 21-year-old Redbreast Thursday during the live Instagram Q&A session I did with our friend Chris Ratcliffe. Jeff at 3Dog on Twitter tweeted this, Congrats, Mark. A very red-breast-appropriate moment. Since retiring a few years ago, yours is the only podcast I still listen to. Thank you, Jeff. Tony Sachs, a fellow spirits writer based in New York, at RetromanNYC on Twitter, shared this. Wow, who even knew what a podcast was 15 years ago? Congrats, and here's to many more. Thanks, Tony. Finally, Travis Adams sent this note from Oregon. I found you while vacationing in Scotland. In 2015, I was with my family on vacation. We were driving through Speyside. We drove the entire country. I was in the car and found you. Listened to the latest episode that had a The Speyside Independent Bottlers Festival is this week at... My wife and kids dropped me off. Two hours before it opened because that's how we do beer in Oregon. The people at the door told me off. My family waited for several hours, and I got to attend the festival, then listened to old podcasts as we drove. I know they all hated it, but I loved it. It's been five years, and I have never missed a podcast, starting over from the beginning. It's my Sunday, and sometimes Monday, solace. Thank you, Mark, and the entire family for making my week better every single week. Thank you very much, Travis, and please give my apologies to your family. Once again, thanks to all of you for being part of Whiskey Cast the last 15 years. It would not be possible without you. 
If you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Let's wrap up the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. We've talked a lot about trade and import tariffs in this episode, including the possibility that the Trump administration could escalate the trade war with the European Union after the EU imposed new tariffs this past week on imports of American vodka, rum, brandy, and vermouth. In most cases, the wheels of American government take a long time to turn. For instance, the rewrite of U.S. alcoholic beverage regulations that went into effect this past spring took several years, starting with agency recommendations, draft regulations, months of public and industry comment periods, and final revisions. The single malt tariffs that took effect in October of last year also took some time and went through the usual public comment period and even a public hearing for those who wanted to argue against the proposal as well as its supporters. So, with two months left to go before the expected inauguration of Joe Biden as president and his team takes over, Along with a lot of work left to get done for the Trump administration and Congress before the holidays, you might think the red tape alone could take a new round of U.S. tariffs on European whiskeys and other spirits out of play before the inauguration, right? Not so fast, my friend. This is one of the few areas in American government where action could take place at the bureaucratic equivalent of light speed, All it would take to impose a new round of tariffs on European spirits under current U.S. law is a recommendation from the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative to President Trump, an executive order to implement it, and then publishing the new tariffs in the Federal Register. Part of that is because the existing tariff regulations included much wider language covering things like all European-made whiskeys, while giving the office of the U.S. Trade Representative the power to pick and choose a precise list from that menu of options. Of course, the same thing could apply to removing the tariffs once the Biden administration takes over January 20th, assuming that its trade team wants to do that, and that is a question we still don't have an answer to. If there's something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist, a unique triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskeys. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. At Doers, we love a good story, and that's why we're always writing new chapters. Like our illegal smooth finished in mezcal casts, with notes of sliced green pepper and a wisp of smoke, a world's first illegal brings cultures together for something truly unique. As a 174-year-old brand, we could rest on our laurels. Instead, we'd much rather continue writing. Because when you keep telling the same old story, that's when people stop listening. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever wondered where Redbreast got its name? Well, let's go back to 1912 and be glad our bird-watching founder didn't spot the bar-tailed godwit that day. Proud sponsor of Whiskeycast, Redbreast. 
Pass it on. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.